Good evening, and welcome to the Whoa. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Issa Pena. I'm a sophomore here at the college studying government, and I'm a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also now take a moment to silence your cell phones. Please take your seats now and join me in a round of applause for Aaron Getzlow, Chair of the Institute of Politics Community Action Committee. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to have all of you here with us for tonight's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Today, we are welcoming the former mayor and secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro to speak with us about his vast experience in politics, both local and national, his historic presidential campaign, and his views on the future of the progressive movement. My name is Erin Getzlow, and I am a junior here at Harvard College studying government and religion. I'm proud to say that I was born and raised in the great city of San Antonio, Texas, which makes me especially thrilled to be up here introducing tonight's guest at the forum. Tonight, it is my great honor to introduce to all of you the former mayor of San Antonio, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and presidential candidate, Julian Castro. Julian, Ca oh. <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> Julian Castro served as US Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Barack Obama from 2014 to 2017. Before that, he was mayor of his native San Antonio, Texas, the youngest mayor of a top 50 American city at that time. In 2012, he gave a rousing keynote speech at the Democratic National Convention, during which he described the American dream as a relay to be passed from generation to generation. After his historic campaign for president in 2020, Secretary Castro launched People First Future in May to help elect bold progressive candidates whose campaigns are focused on improving the lives of all people they hope to represent. In September, Secretary Castro launched Our America with Julian Castro, a podcast with Limonada Media that puts a spotlight on vulnerable communities uh, and focuses on taking a humanizing and hopeful look at how drastically the American experience shifts from one person to the next. In July, Secretary Castro became an MSNBC NBC political analyst. Secretary Castro was also recently announced as the Klinsky Professor of Practice for Leadership and Progress at the Harvard Law School. And in fall 2022, he will teach a course at the law school on the challenges and opportunities of urban communities and how cities are changing because of the pandemic. This conversation will be moderated by Maya Rupert. Maya Rupert is a political strategist, writer, and distinguished fellow with Community Change. In 2020, she served as campaign manager for Julian Castro's presidential campaign and is only the third black woman to have managed a major presidential campaign. When Secretary Castro exited the race, she joined Elizabeth Warren's campaign as a senior advisor. In 2021, she managed Maya Wiley's New York City mayoral campaign. Maya is a nationally respected voice on progressive politics and the future of the Democratic Party. Currently, she serves as a resident fellow here at the Institute of Politics. Thank you all so much for joining us here today, and a special thank you to the former secretary for joining us here at the forum tonight. Please join me in a round of applause in welcoming Maya Rupert and Secretary Julian Castro. You want to take the lead position there? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here um, and to get a chance to interview my forever boss. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could just start us out. We got your bio, obviously. Can you just walk us through a little bit about your path into politics? I feel like so many folks here are asking exactly those questions you were kind of asking when you were thinking about mm -hmm. what, where you wanted to be. And if you could just kind of let us in on what led you here. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to, to, to do this. I'm happy to be here. 
uh, so proud of the work that you have done and are doing. And you know, the Kennedy School made a fantastic decision by bringing you here. Thanks. I told them they should take care of you and make sure that they uh, <laughs> keep you here or something if they right. can. You heard it. <laughs> um, and I wanted to say thanks to Erin, who did the introduction and is from San Antonio, also my hometown. Let's give her a round of applause. Too. Uh, so I uh, have a twin brother, Joaquin. A lot of y'all know that. He always likes to say that, he's, that I'm a minute uglier than he is. Uh, the way to tell us apart is that he has a beard these days. Um, and we grew up with a mom that was a hellraiser. She was part of the old Chicano movement. She was a Chicano activist in the late 60s and early 70s. And so we were born in 1974. By the time we were growing up, she was taking us to rallies and speeches and boring three-hour organizational meetings on different things. And so if you had asked me when I was 15 years old, did I think that I would ever go into politics? I would have said not just no, but hell no, um, for different reasons. I thought it was boring. Um, and because my mom had come from the outside, she actually was part of La Raza Unida Party, which was a third party at the time that was saying that neither Republicans nor Democrats were sufficiently serving the needs, mostly of the Mexican-American Southwest and West. They, re they fielded candidates in places like Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, California. Um, it always seemed, you know, her politics at that time, you know, she eventually, be she had been a young Democrat and then became a Democrat again, but it, they were on the outside. And so I wondered whether through your participation in our system, you could actually make a difference. And I didn't see, you know, in the neighborhoods that I grew up in, like stark evidence, compelling evidence that you can make a difference. I saw a community that um, had low education levels, relatively low income levels, um, obviously had a history of discrimination against, this was a community that was probably 85% Mexican American that I grew up in, and a city that was over 50% uh, Latino and Latina. And so I was skeptical, if not cynical, about whether you could make a difference in politics. My mind started to change when Joaquin and I went away from our hometown to school. We went to Stanford for college and um, <clears throat> cried all the way from San Antonio to El Paso uh, on our first flight over there because we had never been away from home. Um, but saw over there in the Bay Area a place that had higher income levels and education levels and was more ready for the future, was more diverse. And I felt very, very fortunate to have that educational opportunity that I had after going to the public schools of San Antonio and two school districts, SCISD and Edgewood, that were some of the most property poor school districts in the state. They had actually been part of a Supreme Court case in 1973 called SAISD versus Rodriguez, where parents of these school districts had challenged Texas's school finance system as unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause because it basically shafted these kids from poor families. You know, my brother and I grew up in these two districts, and my father taught in the Edgewood School District for 26 years. Um, so I got a chip on my shoulder in college about coming back home and trying to make a difference by creating more opportunity so people could have the same kind of chance that I had and my brother had. And like that became my purpose. Um, and that's why also I focused on local government. Like I had this sense of pride in, in my hometown. My brother and I used to go around and we would say, oh, consider San Antonio to folks there at Stanford. And you know, like anybody was gonna take that and go start their company or something in San Antonio. But like I've always had a real pride in the city. So it was that chip on my shoulder about making my hometown a place of more opportunity. Uh, also, of course, my mom's uh, influence and, and also and public service was always a compromise with myself, like feeling that after law school, I wasn't gonna be happy just billing hours at a law firm. That's not what I was gonna do with my life. You know, or that wouldn't solely be what I would do with my life. And I ultimately left the law practice because of a conflict with my public service. 
So as you're talking, one of the things I'm sort of struck by is so many times um, a lot of folks here, I think, have come to my office hours and talked about a desire to run for office and run for office young. And I always try to sort of channel you <laughs> and try to give advice. So now that you're here and I don't have to channel you, could you just offer the sort of advice you would give to people who are debating, running for office, thinking about doing it young and sort of you know, kind of weighing a few options. Should they go home now? Should they, you know, do some more things, you know, sort of build up a resume? What were you thinking about? What would you have wanted to hear? I mean, I think it's fair to say that there's no perfect recipe. I think that the most important ingredient is that you have to be focused on serving other people and not serving yourself. And you have to know why you're doing it, like the purpose of it. The people that I've seen get into trouble in public office have often been people that are in it for the wrong reason because they want their, you know, their name on the, the nameplate, they want the title, they want to, you know, feel the adulation or the whatever, respect or fake respect that people give you when you have a title. They want tickets to the ball game. They want to get their friends contracts. You see this a lot in school districts, for instance, across the country. For me, the purpose was um, I want to create more opportunity for these folks that often get left behind, like in places where I grew up. And look, any politician that tells you that there's no ego involved, that I didn't do it at all because I like being in front of a crowd, right? They're lying to you. <laughs> there's, there's, of course, an ego involved in it. Politicians generally are performers. But the thing is that the, 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 I think the key is that it should be much, much more about others and doing what you can for other people and not about that, not about you. It's always going to be a little bit about you, but it should be fundamentally about other people. Um, there's no perfect time to, to run. Uh, don't wait your turn. When I ran, I was 26 for city council, and uh, my opponent at the time basically copied the format of my sign with a picture on it and the same sort of breakdown of a look, except he put on top of it experience. You know, basically saying like, that I was I didn't have experience and you know, I guess that I, I shouldn't be elected. Um, in terms of getting started, uh, I'll help try and demystify it a little bit. Um, find the people who orbit around the office that you're trying to seek. For instance, if you're running for school board, the teachers unions, the you know other workers of the district, the PTSA leaders and members, the parents of children in those schools, and talk to people who are in that orbit and active about what's going on and introduce yourself. But then also talk to people that should be involved that aren't and understand why they're not. And from a regular person's perspective that is not very engaged, because that's most people, right? Like, what's, what do they see as good and what do they see as wrong? And what would it take to get them more engaged? Like, you know that you're, you're succeeding in a campaign when you're picking up from regular people, like phrases and ideas, and you're able to articulate, the, integrate those into your vision and articulate them, and that you have this effect in a room that is the most wonderful effect in politics where you see people nodding their head. I only saw that occasionally in Iowa and New Hampshire, <laughs> but uh, and certainly not when I talked about like police stuff, right? Uh, but um, you know, you can listen to folks, introduce yourself to them, understand the issues, and then they start talking amongst themselves, right? And remember that an election is always a choice. Right? It's not you against you know, the Lord himself. It's you against another candidate. And so you always want to remember that. Don't think that it's like you've got to be perfect. A lot of people don't want to do it because they think, oh, who am I? You know, who am I to step up? Uh, you're here. You're smart. You have a lot of talent, capacity, um, good ideas, I'm sure. Like, you definitely are worthy. 
of taking that leap. Um, the other thing I would uh, just say is um, that like, integrate the values that you have into every aspect of your time in public service, from, the, from your campaign and what you articulate to when you hold office and how you make decisions about voting or about other things that you do. Because it's also easy to lose your way. Some people, you know, you're going to compromise in politics. Even Senator Sanders, who arguably is the most liberal, you know, most progressive senator, compromises all the time. Votes for stuff that if he had his druthers, you know, it would, it would be more progressive, right? But everybody compromises. But there are also moments that you have where you have to take a stand and understand what those moments are, you know? So I appreciate that, and I, I want, I'm conscious of time because I want to make sure we have enough time for um, a good uh, discussion. And right before we came out, someone had made the joke that I should have used this opportunity to relitigate all of the disagreements that we had during the campaign <laughs> while I have you in the hot seat. <laughs> but instead of doing that, instead of going back to the campaign, I actually want to hear you talk a little bit about what's going on right now. Um, I think one of my favorite things, honestly, about the campaign was it being based in San Antonio and me getting a chance to meet so many organizers and activists that have been telling everybody for so long that Texas is a battleground state and needs to treat yeah. it like a battleground state. And it feels like now at a national level, we're finally starting to see what so many of you all who've been doing this work in Texas are seeing, which is that resources and time and energy could really pay off. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you are seeing in Texas and your thoughts about Success for Democrats, do, you know, is, is statewide victory possible in 22 or 24 or beyond? And what do you think needs to happen to see that? Yeah. You know, one of the fun things to do is to go on YouTube and to look at the full block of election night coverage for the 92 election. It's fun, right? right. I was going to say. <laughs> Love how you just slipped that in there. <laughs> you can find all of it, like the ABC broadcast, the CBS broadcast, that is like six hours long or eight hours long or whatever from the time they start in the evening until the end, at two in the morning or whatever. And, um, <clears throat> you know, like if you go back to the 92 election, first of all, they didn't have the red and blue maps. It was actually inverted. <laughs> like the blue was Republican and the red was Democrat, whatever. But okay. California was a reliably Republican state for the longest time. I mean, this is the state that produced Nixon, produced Reagan, produced governors like Duke, Duke Mason, Pete Wilson, in the 1990s, which was after 92. I think he was like, you know, 94 or something. Um, he beat Kathleen Brown. Uh, Colorado, Virginia, North Carolina, which is still like a swing state. Um, so when people ask, well, can Texas ever turn blue? Yeah, yeah. And so during the Trump era, it accelerated toward Democrats. In 2018, we won two congressional seats, two state senate seats, 12 state house seats, and then basically held serve in 2020. Like, we didn't pick anything up. They really didn't pick, maybe they picked up one seat in the state house or something. So uh, going into 22, I mean, I think it's gonna be a tough year for Democrats generally because the midterm year of the incumbent president's party is usually tough. I think there are only two or three times since 1926 where that trend has been bucked. Um, but generally, it's moving in that direction because the suburbs, especially, that used to be reliably Republican, places like Fort Bend County and Williamson County, um, they are turning more competitive and in some cases have become Democratic. I think that's going to continue. I think Beto's race this year is going to help because he's like an indefatigable campaigner. And even if people don't agree with him, he's a much more likable character than Greg Abbott. And, um, I think he's going to help move the ball forward. Uh, he could win, too, because Abbott has messed up so much. But even if he is not successful, I think it's going to help move the ball forward. I believe that in 2024 uh, that Democrats can win. Uh, I think that if Ted Cruz decides to run for re-election again, that he may well lose that Senate seat. Can I ask, do you think the 
is the shift? Is it going to be demographic change? Is it sort of different messages resonating? Is it just the people that have been working on this and working on this and really building that organization? Do you have a sense of like what that, what's kind of behind some of those shifts? Well, I think in the Trump era, it was that Trump offended the sensibilities of a lot of the people in those suburbs. People did not, st it was the, it was the opposite of, I was growing up in a time, you know, in the 80s where Republicans were leaving the Democratic Party and saying, you know, I didn't change, the Democratic Party changed. These Republicans were saying, like, I, I just didn't change. There's no, I don't see a place for myself in this party with all this craziness that, that the MAGA movement is all about. And so, to me, um, as long as Trump is on the scene, and especially, although I don't think this is going to happen, but if it did, if he were to win the presidency again, um, if he were to win the presidency again in 24, which I don't believe is going to happen, but if he did, um, Texas would certainly flip in 26, yeah. would absolutely flip in 26, because you're getting those changes in the suburbs, um, because if Democrats do what they should, they will be able to hold the Hispanic vote and even increase it. Um, and you know, you have a growing black community, a growing Asian American community that are helping to power that change as well. So you said <coughs> if Democrats do what they should, I want to mm -hmm. I, I hear a little bit about, we get to hear, for folks that listen, uh, Secretary Castro has a podcast, Our America, mm -hmm. uh, that he, where he gets to delve into sort of issues of the day with our, for, well, I guess you were current colleague. Well, you were his boss, colleague. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> colleague as well, um, Sawyer Hackett. And you all, you know, we, I feel like we get to hear sort of a lot about sort of what is happening. I want to zoom out a little bit and hear from you. What, what do you think the Democratic Party right now is getting right? And then sort of on the other side of that, what are the challenges? What does the party need to be doing more of? I think what's getting right is competence, basic competence compared to Trump. Uh, getting shots in people's arms, getting um, you know, uh, jobs created, uh, pursuing a more inclusive America. Uh, you think about all of the targeting that happened during the Trump era and that continues to happen in state legislatures like Texas and Idaho. I was just in Idaho speaking to the Idaho Democrats since that's a hotbed of de democratic uh, success over there. <laughs> uh, in Boise, yeah, there were like 600 folks. It was nice. Um, um, but I think what they're getting right is a basic narrative of, okay, like we're getting a job done now, there are headwinds against that, gas prices and inflation and the fact that we're still kind of dealing with COVID right now and people are tired of that, even if they're well-intentioned about wearing their masks and everything. There's a fatigue to it and like, hey, why isn't this over already? And people tend to blame the party in charge for that. Um, also, and this was an issue in the Obama administration too, it is an issue that's haunting Biden. Democrats have not been as good either at touting their successes or getting credit. Obama didn't get a lot of credit for a lot of the good stuff that he did, you know? And I remember him in a cabinet meeting saying, you know, during the campaign, we built this brand that was like, uh, that was like Coke. I, forget, I, think, I think he said like Coke, Coca-Cola or Apple or something. And then now, and this was like 2014, like, where is that message and that sense of the brand? And I think Biden is, is challenged uh, in, in the same way. Um, I don't put that just at his feet. I think it's just the ecosystem of it all. Whereas with Trump, the guy was making it seem like he created every single job that popped up in the United States and lying to take credit for things that were good that were happening and then lying about things that were happening that were bad to make it seem like really, oh, it's not happening and it's not that bad. In other words, he took it to an extreme of taking credit, trying to get credit. And in some ways, because of that, he was given more credit than he deserved in some people's minds. He also has a tailwind of a conservative media ecosystem like Fox and Newsmax and um, what's that other one? Uh, IAN or what is it? the one that just got cut off by by AT&T oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. um, Spectrum and stuff. Anyway, there's this media ecosystem on that side that creates this alternate reality and that helps a lot. Right. Right. Yeah. 
One of the things I think we hear a lot when people are sort of asking what is the Democratic Party going to do, it's this question of direction, right? There are, there's a growing progressive movement. You have been a leader, I think, in that, in that movement. And I wonder if you have a sense of, you know, what, is, what does the Democratic Party need to do to make sure that progressives are feeling mobilized? But then I think, I, I'm also curious, what does the progressive movement need to be doing in order to be meaningfully building power in a moment like this? Well, I think the Democratic Party needs to, pro needs to produce results on some of these issues that strike at the heart of a lot of what progressives want. A lot of what they want is, you know, everybody wants better investment in education, you know, better results on COVID, more job creation. But also, I mean, canceling some student loan debt and raising the minimum wage for folks. Um, some immigration reform that was promised and we're still at zero, right? Like, yeah, there have been some executive orders that have been turned around, but Title 42 is still in place too, right? Um, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I think we get into this quandary of thinking, oh, well, if we do this, this is gonna submarine us with the general population or these swing voters. And Democrats don't end up being as bold in their pursuit of their policy goals as Republicans sometimes are. I say that with a little hesitation because I really, I think that, that the Republican Party is totally unanchored now to real policy goals. It's, it's a cult you know, of Trump and, I mean, look at this stuff on Russia. If Ronald Reagan, you know, came alive right now and he saw the way that uh, Tucker Carlson and others are talking about Russia, I mean, it would be completely unrecognizable. I mean, that they used to call the Soviet Union the evil empire, or he did, he referred to it that way in a speech. And I grew up in a time when it was the Republicans were like, how hard can you be on Russia? Some of them are still like that, but you also have this MAGA group that's the opposite of that. I don't think they stand for much anymore. And that should be a weakness, but they're trying to find a way to make it you know, a strength, essentially. Right. Right. All right, I'm going to open up to questions. There are four mics, there are two up at the top, there are two down here. So if folks wanna line up and we'll just kind of go around. Um, as people are lining up, I will ask one final question that I anticipate coming up from someone, so I'm just gonna ask yeah, it. Okay. Because you did say that you think in 24, someone can win statewide in Texas. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, do you have any plans to be that someone for the <laughs> Democratic Party? Well, I mean, I'll, I think I'll jump back into to public service at some point. And I decided not to do that in 2022. Sure. I, I felt like I had just run this marathon and enjoyed spending time at home. My son just turned seven and my daughter turned 13. Uh, you know, they're keeping <laughs> us busy. But I'll jump back in at some point. I haven't made a decision about 24 okay. or beyond that. Uh, but I do think that Cruz is very vulnerable. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that. All right. With that, I will s just start here and just kind of go around. So please. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And I'm a first year at the college. Um, you mentioned uh, your hope about uh, the Democrats' prospects of sort of winning back the future. And interestingly, last Tuesday, uh, Chris Christie was at the forum and he mentioned that you should vote for the party that you're most hopeful for, which, you know, should be a good sign for the Democrats. However, in mentioning, you know, the Abbott-O'Rourke uh, uh, race, it still seems that uh, Beto is trailing in polls, even among independents in Texas. Uh, it seems the Republicans are more likely than not to win the House in 2022. Biden's approval rating is still in the low 40s. And people uh, in, in his Build Back Better plan is, has been stalled. Um, because it seems people in, are, are already sort of privy uh, to progressive ideas in the, in the Democratic Party, like universal pre-K and, and ending student loan debt, as you mentioned, and raising the minimum wage, what do you actually do to pr produce results beyond soaring speeches about the need for unity and criticizing the cult of personality that marks the Republican Well, Party? I mean, I think you can produce results at the local level and in the state level where you have democratic control of school boards, of city councils, county councils, state governments, uh, and demonstrate in a powerful way and then create a narrative from that, tell the story of the success. When I was mayor of San Antonio, we got the voters to raise the sales tax by an eighth of a cent 
to throw off just over $30 million annually in revenue to significantly expand high quality full day pre-K. And you know, that was progressive for sure because in Texas that hadn't been done. You know, we're great at investing in things and roads and bridges and airports and sports stadiums, but not as much as in people. So that's one thing, is that you produce results where you can produce them, even if you can't produce them in Washington, D.C. as much right now. Although Biden has produced uh, you know, a decent amount of, of results with the American Rescue Plan and with the infrastructure plan. And if, they do, if they're able to take the Build Back Better Act in a piece, piecemeal way to some extent, even more so. Um, I also think that, uh, that we have to get better about focusing on those issues that we know um, are progressive but will also resonate with the public, like universal pre-K, like you know, getting big money out of politics that Democrats stand for um, that Republicans have not. In other words, you know, centering on those issues where we have the greatest advantage that are still progressive issues. They're trying to do that with these cultural war issues going after transgender uh, individuals, um, you know, this made up stuff about the ubiquity of critical race theory in schools. Like, their blueprint is always the same. Their blueprint is pick a group that, that is uh, vulnerable and can be easily out of favor with people that are different and then wedge into that in a divisive way. People will remember the 1990 Harvey Gantt, uh, Jesse Helms race, and the ad that Jesse Helms ran with, uh, you know, this, these white hands of this worker getting it, like tearing up, bawling up a paper about not getting a job. And, you know, and it, and the implication was that it was affirmative action, you know, and that blacks were getting all of the opportunity. All of the stuff on him, or Willie Horton in 1988, during the 2000s, Karl Rove making sure that in the 04 election that the issue of gay marriage was actually put on the ballot in states. So you had all crowd that wanted to go out and vote against marriage equality coming out during that presidential race, and Kerry lost that state of Ohio by 130,000 votes. Um, more recently, immigration, the way that Trump used in 2016 uh, immigration to boost himself within that primary and then just generally sowing this resentment and hatred. Um, that's their blueprint. So this cycle is transgender athletes and you know more broadly the LGBTQ community. It's uh, critical race theory. They are just going to find that every single time and we need to be prepared for that. <clears throat> Um, right up here, please. Uh, is this, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am a, a master's student in regional studies of Eastern Europe, so it's kind of exciting for me to not be talking about that right now. <laughs> uh, this is a bit happier, even though we're still talking about, you know, things that are really tough. Um, I, I was a supporter of yours in 2020. I was really into your presidential campaign. And one of the things that really drew me towards it is that I saw you taking policy positions on things that other people weren't talking about. And I think that has to do with what you were saying earlier about listening what people are talking about, um, you know, people who aren't usually involved in politics. And so the thing that really drew me in was you were the first person to take a stance on the resignation for the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, and I wonder, seeing those sorts of policy positions on your site and those kinds of things, and then watching you in the debates, you were really the the uh, police reform guy. I think that was probably a reputation you got. And I wonder what you think about, maybe this is a question for both of you, about a campaign having a signature issue versus being that campaign that really talks about things that other people aren't talking about. Um, and what the value is in sort of being everywhere and being one place more than anyone else is. Well, and, you know, we had this conversation a little bit in the, yeah. the study group that, um, in many ways, mine was the campaign that centered racial justice issues most prominently. Whether you think about that in terms of immigration or uh, police violence, you know, naming the names of black men and women who'd been uh, killed by police on the debate stage and in the stump speech. 
um, going to Iowa and New Hampshire, running an ad in Iowa telling them you guys should be stripped of the first in the nation you know, caucus because you're not diverse enough. You don't reflect the party today or the country today, even though everybody's nice there. Um, it's very tough to build a, a winning coalition centering on that, unfortunately. Um, just like it's tough to build a winning coalition the way that Bernie was trying to build it. On, you know, his lead foot was on class justice. All of us, whether it was Bernie, you know, Warren, or me, you know, one or two other people on different issues, like had similar, similar aspirations and some similar poly, policy positions, but people had their own focus. And I found that for my focus, I mean, especially where we're at in those two states, it just wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna fly enough. Sorry. Oh no. Oh, I'm sorry. I I was just gonna gonna sort of add to that. I mean, look. I think the the decision to there was never a point at which we sort of sat down expressly and said, okay, these are going to be the issues, right? Like yeah, no. Right? So I yeah. think I mean to your to your question of you know is it you're sort of you know kind of known for a host of issues or you're known for an individual one? I think sometimes those are things that, that kind of come out that, you know, get labels that sort of get put on. But the media the tags you with. Right. Like for me, it was immigration for the longest time. Right. And, you know, because you're the brown candidate doing brown things, basically. And so, and we put immigration out as the first policy right. plan, knowing that that would color right. a lot of people's perception of me and my candidacy. You know, now I don't necessarily think that's fair especially when you had a president who had made that the centerpiece of his campaign. So of course you should have a competing vision on immigration. Did it matter that I was, uh, you know, Mexican American um, and you know, in a community that was two and a half hours from the border? Yeah, of course it did. You know, of course I was closer to it, I saw it. Uh, I, I hope I understood it better than most candidates. Um, but fundamentally it was also, I think, a very legitimate way to address a competing vision. Right. Yeah. right. Thanks so much. Yes, right over here. Uh, my name is Luis Fernando Esteban Suero. I am a sophomore at the college. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about something that I assume is near and dear to both of us, and that's the Latino electorate when we're talking about flipping Texas. Mm -hmm. And I think something that was very interesting, despite all the gains that we saw Democrats make in 2020, some of the biggest Republican gains were actually among Latinos, among Mexican-Americans. Uh, we saw the Rio Grande Valley especially went surprisingly Republican. I believe the mayor of McAllen, uh, Texas, is now a Republican, Joaquin Villalobos, uh, if I'm not wrong. So I'd just like to hear your take on how is it that even despite a lot of this harsh rhetoric that we heard from Republicans in 2020, that still Latino communities went red hard in 2020. Do you see that as just a blip and it's gonna be corrected? Is this a trend that we should be more concerned about? Well, I mean, I think that that's too expansive for what happened. It's that in certain counties in South Texas, in a couple of them, you had a pretty dramatic shift. And then in others, it was a more you know, moderate or, or subtle shift. But you're right that among some of these South Texas counties, there definitely was a shift. Same thing in Florida, right? And um, I think it means that Democrats have to pay more attention to those issues and compete for people's votes with more resources and connecting with folks directly. We need to field stronger candidates in those places because for forever, I think Democrats assumed in Texas, oh, well, you know, the Valley's gonna vote uh, Democratic because that's what it's done. Um, and in some ways, Republicans have tried to compete for those votes. Well, the, the analysis that the Texas Democratic Party did of what happened in November 2020 said that Republicans were much more effective at pulling out uh, their occasional voters, uh, people that were registered but didn't, you know, were not consistent voters, infrequent voters. They were better at that, those Latinos there in those counties, than Democrats were. They also registered in the last like three months, um, I think, I wanna say they registered like 90,000 
people in South Texas, or Latinos overall, more than Democrats did. And so that was significant. Those are all lessons learned. Um, I do think, though, that uh, the challenge with South Texas, if people are being honest, one of them is that that place, because it's been mostly Mexican-American, has been ignored, shafted, first by Democrats in Texas and for the last 30 years by Republicans. What gets me is that these guys that haven't done anything, really, for the border, communities, in terms of investing in their schools, their universities, healthcare, you go compare the number of universities down in that huge valley region to just the universities in Houston, the public investments, or Dallas. You have to go all the way up to San Antonio to get to a law school. You have to go to San Antonio to get like the highest level of trauma care. Nowhere in the valley do you get that. Republicans have been sitting on that for 30 years. And all of a sudden, now that they get a little bit of electoral success, oh, well, let's go down there and announce this or that. They didn't care about it before. They have been complicit in keeping that area down. And Democrats, for a long time, were part of that too. So much so that there was a lawsuit that was filed in the late 80s, early 90s, about higher education funding. Um, so the Democrats down there, I mean the elected officials, have to have you know, the spine, the guts, to stand up and not play the game in the legislature of, oh, they're happy just getting this, like create a clear picture of what's happening. I told my brother for forever when he served in the legislature for 10 years, there are too many people, too many Democrats in the Texas legislature that are comfortable. More of them need to be primaried. They think they can just vote for the Republican budget. They can, they're happy getting their chairmanship and like, okay, they're fine. Instead of yelling and screaming about the injustice of what's not being done for their people down there, you know? Like, uh, if I could wave my magic wand uh, down in Texas, it would have been to change some of that with folks so that at least in the minds of those people down there, they would understand who's been fighting for them and who hasn't. And I think that's the beginning of being able to convince folks that, uh, that you're on their side and, and get their support. Yeah. Thank you. All right, right here. Uh, hi, Secretary Castro. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, my name is John Cook, and I'm a first year at the College Studying Government. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about progressive issues. Um, in an answer to a previous question, you talked about how we should use more moderate and more popular progressive issues um, in order to appeal the electorate towards other progressive um, issues. But I wanted to talk about the ones that weren't as popular, um, such as Medicare for All, the Green New Deal. Um, I wanted to ask, since Republicans have found such a success in labeling these policies as socialist or radical, um, trying to get more of the electorate to appeal to the status quo instead of changing things that will help pretty much everyone, um, I wanted to ask, how can Democrats kind of rectify that uh, specifically, how can progressive Democrats um, rectify that? And also, how can progressive Democrats sell these um, policies in a way that doesn't come off as extremely radical or as socialistic as Republicans would put it? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I don't know that we have to rely just on quote unquote moderate proposals, um, but we do have to figure out a way to more effectively uh, articulate the message and when you poll things like Medicare for All or the Green New Deal just in, in a vacuum, it often gets a lot of good support among people. I think that everybody has their role to play. Uh, congressional representatives who represent districts where they are, you know, that reflects their constituency should be leading the way on these things. Same thing with city council members and with governors who, who are able to do that in states. Um, there are places where that won't fly, frankly, right? Parts of Texas are, you know, sometimes some of that. But that doesn't mean that the folks who are running there should just shy away from these issues. They just, they have to find a way to engage their, the people they're trying to represent and, um, you know, sometimes to compromise a bit, but to, to figure out, okay, well, how can you move the ball forward, right? Uh, 
not abandon your principles and not be scared to articulate a different vision, even if it's not the fullest throated vision uh, of somebody else. And so I think on the Green New Deal, for instance, that do I understand the anxiety that some folks in Texas have, politicians over that? Sure, you know? There are a lot of people that work in the energy industry in the Valley and other places in Texas. But the issue is that you have to be able to explain how you're gonna be able to create jobs. And so they, they, are, they fundamentally wanna know that they and their families are gonna be okay. I don't think there are a lot of people out there that are necessarily married to oil and gas. What they're concerned about is their livelihood. So we need to work on, you know, how do you get the best of both of those worlds? Their livelihood and um, getting toward renewable energy as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Hi, Secretary Castro. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I'm a first-year policy student, and before I was a field organizer in Iowa for the Iowa caucus, and I saw firsthand how unrepresentative and inaccessible the caucus is as a system to nominate um, the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party and, and also to be the first in the nation. I know that you mentioned this earlier that you like criticized the caucus while you were running for president campaigning in Iowa. Are you hopeful that for 2024 the party will listen? and we'll switch the status of the first in the nation state to a more diverse state, a larger state like Wisconsin or even Texas? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say I'd leave it up to the, the committee with a reasonable sound process to determine how they should do that, whether it should be one state that is diverse in different ways or it should be a number of states at the same time with a mindfulness toward the cost for candidates to do that, which was one of the things that I was always touted, as you know, you can still do the Jimmy Carter campaign, right? Um, yeah, but I do hope that, uh, that we change the system, not only from Iowa, but also from New Hampshire. Uh, and I have more confidence right now that Iowa will no longer be the first state but uh, it, right now, at least, it looks like New Hampshire is still in the mix. Uh, mind you, New Hampshire is less diverse than Iowa. I think Iowa was like 89 or 90 percent white, and uh, New Hampshire is 94 or 95 percent white. Now, I don't think that should be the only way that these things are evaluated. There should be other variables that are looked at. For instance, um, as Democrats, we're about uh, access to the ballot box. So when you're analyzing who should go first, I think you should actually have a whole list of things. Okay, how easy do you make early, you know, early voting in person, mail-in balloting, uh, election day voting? In other words, which are the states that are operationalizing our values effectively? So it shouldn't just be all, all on race you know, and, and that, but that's an important part, but it needs to be more thoughtful, more nuanced. Um, but ultimately, the idea is, with diversity, with access to the ballot box, with other things, you're saying, with cost of campaigning there, this represents, these couple of states or this state represents that best mix of all of that for our candidates. And we stand by you know, what we find there in terms of the democratic values in action. That's what I'd like to see. Thanks so much. Yes, right up here. Hello, Secretary Castro. My name is Kamadi mm -hmm. Panthier. I'm a sophomore at the College Studying Government. And my question to you is, in your experience serving at both the national and local level, what do you believe should be the role or responsibility of both national and local government in striving to achieve racial justice, as you mentioned, that you ran on in your presidential campaign, particularly with the focus on affordable housing and urban planning? Uh, well, I mean, thanks for the question. They both have a tremendous role to play, um, and there are places where they very much intersect. I'll give you an example of that. Toward the end of the Obama administration, the White House itself, not even through HUD, the White House, released what they called a toolkit for local governments on their land use planning. 20 or so different measures that local communities could take to improve the ability of developers to create affordable housing, and also to help ensure, based on the work of folks like Raj Chetty and others, that, that essentially you give people options 
if they want to stay in their neighborhood, you're trying to combat displacement and gentrification or balance it. But also, if they want to move to a so-called higher opportunity area, you also empower them to do that. Well, the federal government you know, has a role to play in guiding local communities. I don't think they should dictate to local communities, but they can also incentivize them um, and integrate into things like Tiger grants and other competitive grants, and even if they wanted to, CDBG funding, which is you know like the crown jewel of, of local funding from HUD, that you have to get better. Uh, another piece of this was affirmatively furthering fair housing, which was basically our policy in 2016 that said to local governments, you have to get more serious about having an equal housing opportunity plan. At the local level, that's where the rubber hits the road. I, stu I, you know, I sat through a lot of zoning hearings where person after person came up and said, there's no way in hell you're going to build this housing in my backyard. And a lot of times I couldn't tell whether they were Republican or Democrat. Because you had both people that were complaining about essentially what they thought of as these uh, dangerous, dirty, poor people that were going to come into them. That's, that was the, you know, that was the, the stereotype. Mm. People of color, too. But also, in my community, I saw, you know, Mexican Americans talking about, <laughs> we don't want these developments that are largely going to help other people of color. And so it gets very personal at the local level. And what we need is we need local elected officials who are able to help these communities reality test. Like if you have a phobia, let's say you're afraid of elevators, one of the things that people that uh, you know uh, psychologists do, I used to have this more raging phobia of blood. It's called hemophobia. I had to get over it to get my blood drawn once. But um, you know they would reality testing like they would okay on the first day like you would just walk into the elevator and the elevator elevator doors wouldn't close. Uh, but you would be in there and you'd start getting used to it. Or if you're afraid of flying, you'd go and sit in an airplane just in the seat for 30 minutes. And then at some point it would, you know, they would close the door, you know, and then, then you'd go on a 30 minute flight or hour flight and you build, you would reality test to get over that phobia, that stigma. Um, I think that we need to work on the ability of these suburbs and, and also higher end neighborhoods in a lot of communities to reality test, uh, to see that the people that would live next to them are not only going to not lower their property values or commit more crime or you know, problems, that, that they have the same aspirations and the same value as human beings, as people with more money. Thank you. Yes. Hi, good evening, secretaries. Uh, uh, so my name is Jim Wong. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and uh, uh, I'm also a graduate student at Harvard. I just have a uh, one simple question for you. Uh, you previously, like in your conversation, you mentioned uh, being politician that we need to do compromise, uh, compromise if necessary. I totally agree. With, uh, so I totally agree with that. I think compromising is very beautiful thing for being politician to do that. But do you still uh, believe that uh, in today, in today's uh, uh, like uh, in today's Congress and in the uh, Senate? Um, those lawmakers from both sides, from Republican and from Democrats, they still do compromise. Like, uh, for um, example, uh, I mean, left still like they continue to go left, and uh, at the right side they like keep going right. And uh, I mean, during the last century, I would feel much confidence because uh, even even they disagree something, but by the end of the day, they still put the interest of American people on the on on, on the top of that. But uh, I see what happened on January 6th, and I see the other side of the lawmakers, they just keep uh, declining what happened uh, on that event. And uh, also, those things uh, also affect the, the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court of Justice. I couldn't imagine, like, uh, in the last century, Supreme Court of Justice would be um, labeled as a liberal judge or conservative judges. But today, is we uh, when, like uh, so, so every time when I read the uh, uh, New York Times or Washington Journal, they always label the judge as a liberal judge or conservative judge. Sure. And uh, I think a Supreme Court uh, in the United States should be independent from politics. They should be like a very independent. No, well, I share your sentiment of uh, hope that we can become a country that is, uh, you know, represented by people in Congress and in political bodies across the country, state legislatures and city councils and so forth 
that are able to work together and compromise, you know, hopefully to my mind toward a progressive vision, but either way, I mean, get good things done for the benefit of people. And I also think that there's um, an asymmetry right now in these parties, you know, as much as the media love to both sides a lot of things. I mean, there's a party that has totally gone off the rails ideologically and in their actions and so forth. And yeah, you have very liberal people on the Democratic side, but those folks are mostly focused on policy. On the other side, you have people that are engaging in this sort of personal, you know, tear you down kind of politics that I think is, in culture war politics, that I think is different in kind. Um, there are institutional changes that we can make in the long run to encourage compromise. Uh, there are about 15 states right now that have some sort of independent commission or neutral redistricting, for instance. You know, I support the legislation that has been put forward to make that all 50 states. So you take that out of the hands directly of sitting politicians. In some cases, that's going to help Democrats. In some cases, it's going to help Republicans. But I don't think that these politicians should be choosing their people, you know, guaranteeing their own success, basically. And if you get districts that are more balanced, as a natural outgrowth of that, I think you're going to get representatives in Congress who have an incentive and will, you know, talk to the other side and try and come to some more compromise. I don't want to end on a, you know, a totally gloomy note because I think that they're not at zero. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't get the headlines, a legislation that does get worked on, other things that do, does get worked on, that is still productive. And um, this is sort of related to that. One of the biggest challenges with people in politics, politicians, you know, is not even their ideology, it's the chumminess. This, this clubbiness among folks. A lot of politicians develop like a poor me philosophy, you know, almost like you're there to serve them instead of they're there to serve you. And unfortunately, I think that affects, I think that, you know, to my mind, more Republicans than Democrats, but it does affect people on both sides of the aisle. And you have to figure out ways to bust that up, to fundamentally make people more accountable to the people that they represent instead of to these people giving them a lot of money or folks who are in the bubble of getting overheard, over listened to by them. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna have to do last question here. There you go. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Secretary Castro. My name's Michael. I'm a student at the Kennedy School here. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask what you miss most about working in local government and what lessons, strategies, perspectives you took from being on city council, from being mayor, to running a massive federal agency. Well, I miss the sense that, that you can, like a lot of mayors will tell you, uh, that you can get things done, that there's an immediate, often immediate or medium-term result on your work, whether it's simple things like getting the pothole fixed or getting sidewalks in a neighborhood where they've been waiting for them, fixing people's drainage or getting a library built, um, you know, and you, you are such a part of shaping the life of a community. And I think probably the smaller the city, sometimes the more true that is. Uh, I miss that. Um, and I also think that, to answer the second part of your question, that uh, a lot of it at the local level is about the vision that you bring. For folks that get into it, like I said, have a purpose, but have a vision if you're at the local level of what, what you want the community to be, to look like. It should not just be your vision, it should be informed by the experiences of, you know, a multitude of people in the community. But you need to, I think leadership, wherever you are, starts with that vision of knowing where you want to go. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your questions and thank you everyone so, so much for joining us tonight. And thank you very truly. Thank I'm you. Yeah. So I'm just so conscious of so many people here who are beginning careers. And it is my fervent, fervent hope that at some point in your career, you have the opportunity to work for somebody who you respect, you genuinely love, and that for the rest of your career, no matter where you are, you will always think of them as your boss. <laughs> and <Sure. There> you <laughs> that go. is 
exactly who you are for me, and I'm so grateful that you came here today. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.